Thanks everyone for uh, coming out and supporting this program. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, where I'm from and my practice and things like that. Uh, I basically grew up in the Bay Area and uh, went through school in the U.S. for the most part and uh, did my dental training in Cleveland and from Cleveland I went to North Carolina at Chapel Hill to do my initial perio specialty and implants. Uh, from there I um, received a, a fellowship at University of Bern, Switzerland uh, for pros and for maxillofacial uh, treatment. And then I served in the military at uh, Fort Hood, Texas uh, for three years and I did another year of a maxillofacial fellowship. I didn't stay uh, throughout uh, the whole military career. Um, I was very fortunate to be recruited uh, to UBC in Vancouver to be the uh, grad perio and implant director. And from there I transitioned into private practice where um, I run a very uh, small boutique practice. I practice uh, primarily prosthetic and implant rehabilitation. Uh, it's a comprehensive treatment that I provide for the patients and uh, I really enjoy uh, helping patients from uh, localized defects, single teeth implants to full mouth uh, reconstruction. Uh, this is just a little bit of uh, what my office looks like and um, uh, there was a little running joke about my, uh, my uh, I guess, what I like about Marvel superheroes and uh, Iron Man happens to be one of my favorite. So um, with that in mind, thank you for coming and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here at the AEP. This is my first AEP in a couple years. Uh, I wasn't really allowed to travel uh, out to the US last year, so it's great to kind of be in a, a nice warm weather climate. Uh, that's for sure. If I showed you some photos of what I look like in April of 2020 on a full hat, hat suit and transitioned for almost six months uh, before I started getting into some normalcy. So this afternoon, I want to spend some time uh, talking about this special balance between success uh, and complications associated with implant rehabilitation. And I think one of the things we have to really focus on is our challenges that we face. These challenges is that there are so many realities of what we've gone through in the last 60 to 70 years of osteointegration. And so what we need to think about is we have to think about creating a blueprint in order to have a successful long-term result. Not only that, we have to trust the process with biology in terms of what the patient presents with, what kind of problems do they have? Is it fixable? Can we do something to help them? And one of the things I really, is really near and dear to me is this concept of prosthetically guided therapy, where ideal meets reality. Because now, in the digitized world, we're focused so much not only just on extraction, immediate implantation, but we're focused on so much on this concept of guided surgery. And so we have to think about some of these considerations. Is guided surgery really that accurate? Think about who's really planning the case for you. And also, where are planning the matrices? They're placing those implant matrices in the levels of valve bone. If there has been bone resorption, trauma, infection, that area of bone, the ridge, is typically more lingual or more palatal which means that when you place your implants, you have the false pretense that you are in great bone. Technically, you are correct, but when it comes to the prosthetics, you might have a concavity that's over the facial of that implant. With that concavity, the problem is that the patients then complain about food impaction, and that food impaction could lead to peri-implant disease and infection. So I'm gonna share with you a few, uh, few examples of that and how we can avoid that. And when we're managing complications in oral implant therapy, it's the what, the when, and how to limit the damage. Trusting the process. There is significant thought into this area because what's enough? How much tissue is enough? The tissue challenge 
is really understanding how this remodeling process works. How do we go from the very beginning before treatment, and if we're going to replace the site with an implant using the best technology from our implant to zirconia abutments, maybe an anodized titanium abutment, to a full zirconia crown. What type of zirconias do we choose? Um, and we want to really look at genetics and individualized tissue phenotype. What is that presentation? And so we have to balance biology and create the proper foundation. Because once we take out a tooth and we place an implant, we're already behind, four millimeters behind, circumferentially. We, don't, we lose the blood supply in those particular cases. So, you know, as a periodontist, and we always look at soft tissue, and so soft tissue is always the issue, but you have to remember that the bone always sets the tone as well. So in order to support soft tissue, we have to have enough hard tissue. In a situation like this, this is not an orthodontic complication, this was from trauma. So rather than take out both of those teeth, eight and nine together, and place implants, I staged it. I staged it and I took out eight first, developed the site, did a lateral sliding pedicle combined with a connective tissue graft in order to achieve that type of an appearance. If you took a free gingival graft from the palate, that soft tissue over eight will never look like number nine. And then from there, once we provisionalize eight, then we can treat number nine and then I finalized this particular patient with almost three sets of provisionals. Uh, those were initially, to the photo on the far left, is basically a Tessera uh, PMMA from Korea at the time. And then I finalized it with uh, zirconia crowns after. When we talk about complications, complications, there's so much associated with oral implants. We have surgical complications with anatomic deficiencies. We have mechanical stress, screw overload, iatrogenic therapy, under-torqued, over-torqued. The biology and the genetics, along with the microbial, have significant, significant effects on the longevity of our implant treatment. So this is a synopsis a snapshot, if you will, of all, so many different things that we all see as practitioners, from implants being lodged in the sinus because there wasn't enough bone, to the middle picture on the top, I will share this particular case with you. The one um, thing you want to look at is if you look at the canine on the 4-3 position, or the 27, you see that it's root canal treated. And the reason it's root canal treated is because the implant was driven through the apex of that tooth. And if you look at the implant next to it, the top part, the abutment connection, the coronal structure was cut off. And I'll show you comprehensively why that was the case. And then you've got complications of palatal placement, and that happens we don't normally see that. We see more buccal angulation, if you will. But palatal, the reason for that is a patient that has a limited intraoral opening. And by limited intraoral opening, you try to basically fit that twist drill and that implant into the space. Um, the bottom ones, we look at sinus infection. And the middle on the bottom is retained cement. Periimplantitis developed because of that, and when I flapped it back, that's all the cement that I found. So that actually factored into so much bone loss that you see on the photo next to it on the right. The last photo on the far right is interesting because if, if we could see the threads, they actually intertwine together. And I'm not really sure how that's really possible, but Eventually, I took those implants out. I actually, uh, the worst part is that prosthesis is they had six to eight implants. That prosthesis was cemented on, so I actually had to tap 
that thing out. And luckily, the abutments were not custom abutments. They were just the conical abutments that they rested on. So what do we need to do when choices become limited and treatment has gone in the wrong direction? This is what we have to step back in terms of what the complications may be. Let's evaluate the current condition. What are our limitations from a surgical standpoint to a prosthetic standpoint? What's realistic and what does the patient want? Does the patient want to try to go for more implant treatment or more grafting procedures? And taking a few steps back, is this really still an implant option? Because a couple decades ago, we focused, we weren't at the guided surgery point yet. We focused on extraction, immediate implantation. And what happened? Well, how close is too close? That's really for eight and nine. And when I received this referral, it, it wasn't for soft tissue grafting, it was to help restore the case. And I said, there's no way that I'm gonna be able to restore the case in an ideal, cleansable manner and have long-term predictability. I said to my friend, who's a general dentist, I said, the only really good thing about this is if you run a piece of floss through those healing abutments, there's a nice twang there. That's about it. So the good thing is I didn't have to take this, these implants out. They, they went back to the oral surgeon who placed them, and I was lucky because my trephine was only about 10 millimeters long, and those implants were 16 millimeters time. So I asked my friend to create a surgical guide based off of a functional wax-up. And so here is, before I do that, as we all know in this room, malpositioned implants always osteointegrate and they never fail, and un unless you have to take them out. So here's round two. The spacing's better, but it's still facial, especially on the number eight site. And what happens is the patient was feeling that bony sequestrum where that white spot is within the vestibule. So they used what they called an aesthetic abutment, but that wasn't the right choice of abutment because you're limited by the ability to shape your abutment back, especially if your placement bodily is not in the right position. And I was fortunate to be able to get these photos because the patient went to another office, had them restored, and if you look closely in between the eight and nine and the side of the nine, that's all cement that's left over. And this was about a week after they delivered it. So there's a feather edge that's where the pink porcelain is. And let's see. How long will this last? This is two years after the delivery. And I remember speaking to the parent, um, the mom actually said, the general was wondering if we could do some soft tissue grafting here. And I said, well, fortunately, this isn't maybe not really a good implant point because periodontally, we have all these issues with recession and certainly oral hygiene effectiveness. So with that in mind, we know that in managing oral implant complications, it's a multifactorial problem. There's a lot of things that go wrong and can go wrong. Secondly, now that we've seen extraction immediate implantation problems, I'm gonna show you what some of the pitfalls of guided implant surgery are, not only from a surgical standpoint, but from a prosthetic standpoint. And these are things that patients don't see. Once the implant's in, they don't see the implant. They see the tooth that goes in. And they see and they tell me, you know, Dr. Thai, I get food impaction every day despite using a custom anatomic abutment and a full contoured crown. 
guided tissue regeneration, what are the possibilities and limitations, and complications associated within the antral cavity. So let's take a look at regeneration therapy and what it really means to help rebuild the natural tissues. Well, we know that the process of regeneration therapy involves three important factors. Number one, the patient's natural and innate factors. Number two, biological factors. And number three, physical factors. Physical factors are in the form of grafting materials, membranes, um, resorbable, non-resorbable, titanium cages, bone plates, sonic weld, ridge splitting techniques. And in natural factors, genetic predisposition, periodontal condition, dental alveolar condition, and certainly phenotypic presentation of whether or not a patient has a thick or thin periodontium, that affects the level of regeneration therapy. Within biologic factors, we've got a host of materials from antimicrobial and gel therapies, hard tissue replacements with autogenous grafts, sticky bone, if you will, and if you throw in PRF and PRP, they host as an adjunct to all of this. But we have to be selective with all of these materials because does it make sense that we're using a PRF or a PRP as a barrier? And the answer is no, because if we look at the research and we look at the growth factors and the chemokines and the cytokines that are involved, how long does those materials last? It's just go back to biology. Go back to biology and understand the healing process. And then there's this human amnion chorion membrane, which I'm gonna spend a bit more time talking about and why I use it in my practice. I've had the opportunity to use it about seven years at this point. Um, I actually used it initially to repair perforations within the sinus um, and found really good results with it uh, from things like from lost implants to implants placed into the antral cavity without grafting. And you might have four or five millimeters from bone crest to floor of the sinus and they drive the implant right through the Schneiderian membrane. The membrane gets uh, infected or the, the osteum gets clogged and it becomes a very big problem for these patients. So we know that there are certain factors, certain characteristics involved in modern day amnion chorion membrane. It's immunoprivileged. It has an antimicrobial and sustained release which is a big factor. It has inflammatory regulation and wound healing regulation that's shown over in 200 to 250 chemokines and cytokines. And one of the things I like to use it as is it's both a barrier and a carrier that has a host of natural growth factors. However, I do use other membranes and you'll see that when I do some corrective regeneration treatments. So in my practice, periodontal regeneration and rejuvenation through GTR. I also use it in non-surgical periodontal therapy via curatage, antibiotic ridement, as well as soft tissue laser therapy. And then I add and I place this amnion corn membrane within the pocket and then I seal it. I also use it in extraction site development and immediate implantation, guided bone implant regeneration and natural host tissue development. And in advanced guided bone cases, customized cages, sonic weld, which is a uh, com combination uh, PLA, PGA material that is used in craniofacial uh, reconstruction and surgery. 
and certainly some of the bone plate therapies that uh, Dr. Israel Putman was showing in the previous session with his laminar bone. I also like using it in management of peri-implant disease where a defect has been infected for a long period of time and the chronicity of the infection creates all these little pits within the alveolar bone. And in sinus augmentation, repair and reconstruction, um, I'm working on a double membrane technique where I place it onto the host tissue, place my bone replacement graft material, and then follow that by placing another membrane over that. But primary closure is critical. So you have to think about primary closure. We know the biology already. We've, we've heard people from Danny Boozer over the years in the 80s to the 90s. Tissue heals when you protect the wound. So let's take a look at some of these examples from periodontal defects to advanced bone defects to sinus defects. Managing periodontal infection and stage guided bone regeneration. Here's the patient history and treatment. The patient was referred for the upper right sextant. Pain was in the 1617 or 23 region. There was a plan for a staged approach, initially removing the number two and allowing initial healing, allowing uh, some pluripotential cells to get into the extraction site and soft tissue keratinization that closed the extraction area. Phase two, removal of number three, sectioning of the bridge and placement of a single implant at the four followed by guided bone regeneration, growth factor therapy, and tissue regeneration. Here, here's our patient, three unit bridge from four to six. Um, and you see here that the two, the, th the two is barely, barely hanging on, but that develops significant pain and abscess. So the strategy was to first remove that. And once we remove it, you can appreciate the depth of the defect as well as the overall size of the defect. And we also discovered that on tooth number three, we had a grade three through and through uh, frication as well. And generally, when we get cases like this, I like to remove the, the tooth that's involved, clean it out, place some antibiotics localized into the extraction site, flush out the area, maybe put some sponge stand in there. I have put some uh, amnion chorion membrane to the defect and basically suture it close in a similar position. Then I return to the site within six to 12 weeks. At six to 12 weeks, I have the advantage that the extraction site has closed. <clears throat> um, I don't have to worry about moving the mucogingival complex and trying to reestablish some type of positional closure. But once I get to this stage, um, my more definitive plan would be to section the bridge, remove the number three, and then release the tissue so that I can get full relaxation and now I can do my rege regeneration therapy. So here's at the extraction, you can see the fall off and the significant size of the defect. I placed an implant at the pontic space at the four. This happens to be an internal connection uh, cone log progressive. And then I place my bone replacement graft. In this case, I use a combination of, when I work with larger grafts, I like to use a combination of bovine and autogenous. Harvest the tuberosity area, and I mix that within the bovine. Now, the other thing you see is you've got your bioexclude that's placed over the facial of that defect. It was a pretty large defect, and then at the coronal part, I'm going to have a section that goes across the extraction site. You also see a material over the facial of the implant 
and the number four or number five position, and that's what I use as a contour graph. And that's basically uh, a product that Geislich makes. And that allows me to develop the facial area prior to my prosthetic. So that's really for prosthetic uh, therapy. The other thing now is you have to consider closing this. So what I do is I make a few different types of cuts. One is right at the distal of that area of the, of the number two. And then I go into the vestibule and create a, a, a coronal rotational advance flap so that when I close this, this little area where the palatal soft tissue is, I'm sorry, is there a, is there a laser on the other mouse by chance? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And, what I, and my goal is to take the papillary area and I'm going to, I'm going to rotate the distal papilla and have it meet here. And then rotate this whole area across. Because remember, when we started, there was a significant defect and the depth of that tissue was about eight millimeters up high. So this is what I'm gonna do. There is that distal papilla. I have maybe half a millimeter opening. I'm going to trim the soft tissue. This is, called, this is a 60 monoglic suture. And I'm going to close all of this because dimensionally, I've got a lot of graft material that I've changed in, that I've placed into the site. There is my graft material implant with cover screw. That's the healing. Reentry. Placement of the second implant. This is a 5-0 cone log progressive internal connection tri-channel. Um, I placed a, a gingival former at the four position and a cover screw on the implant. I generally, if I have to do any grafting, I do it two stage. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I did it one stage. Will, will one stage work? Absolutely. Can it get contaminated? Yes. So I feel that to protect the graft, I'd rather, I'd rather cover it and then later on expose the implant. There's the healing, if you look at the soft tissue. Um, from here, gingival former, I'm gonna take using closed tray impression uh, copings. Place back my healing abutments. There is my implant and bone regeneration. And this is, it is above the, uh, the fixture. This can be a little bit of a problem, particularly with those impression copings, but I'd rather have more bone than less bone. And then I work with my lab and we create, this is Argen Z, high translucent zirconia. And we're using um, non-locking abutments and we create this uh, particularly for bridge and posterior areas where we don't have to layer any porcelain on the facial. Uh, from lab design using ExoCAD, um, my lab guy sends me these designs for abutment and the prosthetics, and then we, we discuss the case together. And I prefer a screw type access opening, especially in the posterior. And then if you look at before and reconstructed after, and then we use a similar uh, flowable composite where you can almost not tell where the access opening is. Um, I also rebuilt this patient's lower right uh, that he had existing implants and um, experienced periimplantitis. Uh, but at this point, I think the patient was really uh, happy with the result and finally getting some posterior teeth for him. What about when complications happen at the surgical phase? 
So the patient history is that there were placement of implants at the 30 and 31, but failed due to infection and early failure. The implant at the 28 was placed into the natural tooth at 27, necessitating root canal therapy due to severe pain and sensitivity. The implant at 29 was damaged at the coronal aspect as the restorations were compromised due to severe angulation of 28, which was an internal connection implant. And if we remember this picture from a few slides ago, I ended up, when I saw the patient, this is what she had. And um, she was quite terrified because she did suffer significant infection. So the proposed treatment and reconstructive plan is for 29, removal of the existing implant with planned guided bone regeneration. 30 and 31, placement of implants in a staged approach, followed by um, any bone regeneration as needed. And we left the 29 implant option depending upon uh, our prosthetic treatment. And so going to the surgical area, I removed the prosthesis, opened the surgical site, and sorry guys, we're, uh, it shut off again. And what was really interesting is that if you look at the, the 29 implant, the 29 implant was cut right at the, at the coronal aspect. And um, if you look closer, it looks like there's some type of composite or artificial material around the threads. When I took it out, I couldn't really figure out what this material was. Um, and so that was removed. And I, I was trying to get the history between the restorative practitioner and the periodontist who did the initial surgery, but the records were fairly limited. And I think what may have happened, as I discovered later on, is that the path of draw was not available. That was a problem. So they cut off that, and they, that's why the patient only had that pontic uh, coming off the implant at 28. For 30 and 31, I prepped. Um, these were uh, 3.8, sorry, cone log progressive internal connection. These are the fixture mounts that are friction fit. And then I placed uh, some allograft material that was up in putty form. And then from there, I used um, a bioexclude membrane covering over the bone graft, and then uh, did some uh, locking sutures to close up the site. I re-entered the area. Uh, this area healed really nicely. I then proceeded to place an implant at the 2.9. In addition to that, uh, prior to the placement of the implant, I took a small core, sent it in for biopsy, and confirmed that this was mature lamellar bone at the 2-9 site. Placed this back as a provisional. Here's the implants in place. And we then went to the design prosthetically for abutments and crowns. Uh, and then finalized it with, this is um, a zircon zon, uh, pretau zirconia. Uh, this particular uh, material has been a workhorse in my, in my lab, and you have the ability to do uh, various types of porcelain additions and staining. Uh, so aesthetically it's quite nice, but very, very strong. Uh, so no, no issues with micro cracks and fractures. Here is the crowns in place uh, prior to sealing the access openings. And then again, using that specialized um, flowable material to seal the access openings. And here's the final result. Here you could really see this implant going across the apical end of the 2.7. Okay, let's go to guided surgery. When you think that guided surgery is going to be helpful and make your life a lot easier, 
So here's the history. The GP referred the case with two existing implants at the eight and nine. The case was planned for guided surgery using a three-shape software by a local lab. Hard copies of the CVCT were sent to me, which showed approximately three plus millimeters of buccal lingual width. The GP performed flapless guided surgery in January of 2021. The referral was for prosthetic treatment with possible soft tissue grafting. This is the planned case. Technically looks okay, it's in bone. But this is the clinical picture of the piece of paper that they sent me. Um, it doesn't, it, it appears that those might be healing abutments until I saw the patient. And when I saw the patient, this is what I saw. And it's a case where you really can't do any soft tissue treatment. The implants are facial, obviously, we know that. Uh, if you took a slice of the CVCT, you know that there is no bone on the facial, and that's off of one implant. So let's look at it. That's the uh, occlusal view or incisal view. No bone here, no bone there. Let's take a closer look. One's angled towards the palate. The nine is angled towards the facial. I tried to carefully remove these and without having to cut away bone because they had lost bone apicocronally already. And I don't know if you could see it, but there seems to be some kind of micro crack at the coronal surface. These are 3.0 implants, very small, even though the patient had small teeth um, to begin with. So I went to a technique that I, I've been practicing for probably 20 plus years, and that's using a customized titanium cage of some type. Um, there are a host of different brands and manufacturers. This happens to be like a Walter Lorenz. Um, and I fixate that right into the nasal spine, right here and on this side. And then this I spread out, it's almost like a, um, an ice cream, a waffle cone. And then I place my bone graft material into the site. And then from there, um, layer uh, bioexclude right on top and inside up and over the facial. I also use a compressed collagen material uh, over the graft material to help protect this further. And then now, to close this, I'm going to use several, um, several different sutures and close this area. I've left this purposely open so that it allows the soft tissue to granulate across. And you'll see that as the tissue heals, I score this area so that I can create a bleeding surface and then that allows it to granulate across over time. So this is at two weeks healing. This is a cross section of the actual cage. The material that we've added is pretty much along this boundary right here. So it's quite significant. And I went back to my CBCT unit, it's a Serona Galileos. I uh, added tissue to the skull view and it looks like it's just a, a protuberance right over that area. I waited eight months for this to heal and then I planned um, not necessarily a guided surgery, but I used a, a surgical guide that was planned to see if I can get it as close to a screw type restoration at the re-entry, this is what I found. Um, and then at the initial preparation, there's this massive bone right in here. And I use some ridge expansion burrs, and that's why you do see this contour. But once you place the implant, because it's a larger diameter, then now you've got this irregularity. Now this irregularity, I'm gonna fill that with bone material. And then these are 3.3 um, cone log implants. 
There is the additional bone graft to further round out the site. And then I use another box glued right over the front of that. And then just using monoglycic suture, simple closure. Uh, analog based impression. I did take a digital scan body as well for comparison. Uh, gingival formers in place after the impression. Here is a cross section of the CBCT showing the bone material over the facial uh, in one implant at the middle and the other one as it's a bit more irregular, but there's pretty good bone there. So the phase, the prosthetic and tissue design, um, basically got a tissue sculpting with provisionalization, uh, tissue stabilization and rejuvenation and final prosthetic design of the superstructure along with custom abutment design. So going back clinically, I'm going to deliver these. Um, these are Argen PMMA um, lab process provisionals, screw type. They will have that buckle opening, but it's temporary. And uh, we just want to be able to sculpt the soft tissue at this stage. The other thing that it allows us to do is reevaluate the soft tissue. If you remember, there was recession more recession along this tooth on, on the 10 as well as the seven. And then we allow this. I usually let, like for the provisionals, I, I leave it in for anywhere from six weeks to 12 weeks, especially in the anterior. In the posterior, I, I don't usually do that. And then going back to um, planning the abutment design and superstructure design, uh, these were Zircozon Pratal 4 for specifically more for anteriors. I, I like to use anodized titanium abutments with zirconia on top. I don't generally like to use all zirconia abutments, particularly if the fixtures are small because of potential fracture, which I've seen with um, 4.5 millimeter fixtures that fractured right at the neck. So um, my lab and I talked about this and we basically use this kind of design. Sometimes we stain the abutments as well to match the stump shade of any of the adjacent teeth if needed. And then if we look at before and we position the superstructure after, uh, recession coverage here and here, a little bit better here. I know we were, aren't able to get it completely perfect, but um, I think the patient was very happy with this end result, um, given the fact that she thought she was going to have the crowns done since last July. OK, I've got one last case. I'm going to run it through really quick. This is really a, kind of a crazy situation. Um, an endo colleague of mine calls me up and says, hey, um, I need help to, uh, to close this soft tissue opening. And I just performed apical surgery on this case. So this is what it looked like. And what you're seeing is the root and, uh, and probably bone exposure. And then they did the apico, and I'll give you the history Endodontic therapy on three and two. Uh, crowns were fabricated after. The patient was still symptomatic, and they referred for retreatment and apical surgery. And then the complications arose with the soft tissue exposure, so the referral for some form of gingival augmentation. Well, this one threw me for a loop because it, when I reflect these flaps, usually I am doing it as full thickness, and part of my elevator disappeared, and I didn't know what was going on. So I'm going to show you this picture. When you realize that things are going bad quickly, let me outline this for you. Obviously, no bone, no bone here, no bone here. A cut was made up here, and a cut across across here. 
23 millimeters across, maybe 15 to 16 millimeters of missing bone, 12 millimeters of missing bone here, 10 here, and complete tuberos the tuberosity was missing. So, so much for my connective tissue graph. Um, so I kind of had to think out of the box here because the patient now is thinking, what do you mean I got to take one, one or both of the teeth out? Because I just had all this endo treatment and a crown in the last two years. So I said, okay, let me hang on to this. Let me do what I can first and let's attempt something. So I went back to a treatment modality using a different type of a cage. And generally when there's exposure of the sinus, I don't, the, the membrane was intact, but very leathery. So I used the material basically a bovine derivative, but it had collagen that held everything together. And the goal essentially, so I'm gonna place a collagen membrane over the exposed Schneiderian membrane. There's no, there's no um, exposure or hole or anything like that. Then I'm going to fixate this cage and extend this, that's the advantage of this material, and use this to try to close the bony gap. So here's the treatment progress. Phase one, advanced bone augmentation with titanium cage. Two, titanium cage removal uh, around three months and extraction of the two. Advanced further sinus augmentation, extraction of the three. End osseous implant placement when we get to that point at two and three. And prosthetic design and superstructure. So, here we are prior to removal of the three and further sinus treatment. Cage has been removed. This, you'll see, has formed. We've closed the gap. It is now 14 millimeters this way. And this gap is still big, but this is where the mesial root is. This has closed. Again, the sinus membrane was really, really leathery, but no tears. So I was able to elevate it, take an instrument, go all the way to the palatal, fairly uh, large patient, uh, German in descent, male. Um, I packed bovine with autogenous from the opposite tuberosity. Then from there, I used a putty with allograph to fill the rest of the space. I placed my amnion corian membrane over that, closed it, and here is at the extraction, here is at the graft, which is here, the mesial buccal root. We get to implant placement at the two and the three. You can see this on a periapical cover screw, gingival former, to confirm that with a CBCT. You can see the cortication that's occurred during the healing. Cross-section at this particular fixture shows us that bone is across around the implant, but very, very lingual and closure of that opening. Here's the abutment design using ExoCAD and crown design. Again, looking at screw retain, look at how far the screws are lingually. Again, zircozon, uh, pratal, zirconia. I have talked to the, the patient is two years out right now. Um, things have, are stable, but I have talked to this patient about doing a contour graft here. As he said, sometimes he does action into the site. And so with that, um, I think continuing into the future, I think for, for all of us really is to look at individual planning of patients, focusing on 
a prosthetically guided approach, and creating a blueprint to help our patients in both surgical and prosthetic intervention. The importance of continued long-term research on enhanced biological factors, which continue to help us predictably treat our patients. And I wish I could say something else, but unfortunately, managing complications will probably be around for a long time. And uh, I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank Snowasis Medical and uh, the AAP for this uh, amazing opportunity to be here amongst friends and colleagues. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the future now that things are kind of a bit more normal. Um, this is where I'm at, um, at the Fairmont Medical Building in Vancouver. Um, this is what it looks like in the summer. It doesn't look like that anymore. That's why I came to Phoenix. Um, I also want to show you this picture. April 2020, didn't know what was going on. Hazmat suit fully covered. I'll tell you, this suit was so hot. I started with scrubs and ended up with just a pair of shorts under this. And I, I, it was just crazy. I had no staff. I had a part-time uh, receptionist who I draped completely and had her hold the suction tip. And so I learned to go back into my dental training. I, I, I set up, I cleaned up, I ran the lines, I sterilized. I only saw two patients in the day, and I was done by three. And I hadn't even done the charting yet. So it was, it was so crazy. Um, different rendition, the cap came off. Uh, because I'm a huge, huge Marvel fan and Iron Man is my favorite, I took this uh, helmet, took it apart, and spray painted and recreated an Iron Man helmet. I've got three of these. I had full mouth, uh, full mask respirators that I wore. And uh, this shows as we progress into the second year of COVID, uh, I still was wearing a half mask respirator. This was under a, um, a global microscope. I was doing a sinus uh, operation. And then this is more within the last year. But I'm so glad that I got through it. And I'm sure all of you have gone through some crazy, crazy times. But with that, thank you so much. And thank you for staying. I know it's a tough hour. But uh, if there are any questions uh, related to my lecture or anything that you would like to ask, I would like to open the floor up for questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so the question is, do I have my patients wear a some type of provisional prosthesis? And the the short answer is for sure. Depends on the case. Um, Single tooth to full mouth reconstruction, um, sometimes they wear two to three provisionals. Um, so let's say on a single tooth implant, anterior, there will always be at least one provisional. So for example, if I took out a number nine and an existing crown or PFM was there, I will reline that crown to fit onto a temp abutment at the time of surgery if I decided that my ISQ level was high enough and I felt comfortable that I could control the occlusion. So that's provisional one. Um, I also will pre-plan an Essex appliance prior to that in case for some reason, let's say I, I can't fit it on that well. And so they have an Essex appliance or a flipper partial, that flipper partial at the apical terminus of the acrylic, I will add to it with composite and I will create an ovate design. So I didn't show any of that today. Um, I, it's kind of part of um, my aesthetics lecture, single tooth lecture, but I usually will extend the pontic into the extraction site. 
and you could do everything in the site itself. You can bone graft it, you could place your implant with the bone graft, but the key component is that you support the soft tissue at the sulcus level because no, no matter what, you'll have three to six millimeters of unsupported soft tissue depending on um, whether a patient has a thick or thin, uh, thin uh, phenotype. And so you wanna always support that two, three millimeters in, and that way you trick the site into thinking that you haven't taken a tooth out at all in the first place. So that's for single teeth. For let's say a full mouth, like um, I don't do a lot of all on four or all on X. I usually, if possible, uh, in a case where uh, there's severe decay but no periodontal disease, I take out the teeth and do full mouth clearance and then place the implants immediately and graft along the site. I'll prepare that with an immediate denture, but I'll also take a fixture level impression at the time of surgery. Either I scan it or I do PVS. I still do a lot of PVS uh, because when you do full arch, I don't find that it's as accurate. And I'll get the lab to put in overtime and they'll basically create um, an acrylic bridge for me within two to three days. So when I do anything immediate, it's between one and three days, 24 to 72 hours. I don't like to turn any more screws after 72, just because I know you could wait a week and a half to two weeks before you get some bone softening and you get that level of retraction of the mechanical um, stability of implant placement, but I usually wanna be less than five days and put something in. When I deliver it, I don't torque it. I only hand tighten. Hand tighten to, it's probably gonna be six to eight Newton centimeters. I think it could be safe. You could do uh, more like a locator protocol, which is like 10 Newton centimeters. But for sure, I, there's a lot of provisionals in between. Like you, I think you only saw like the, post, the first patient with the upper right bridge, there was only, I went straight to final. Um, the anterior patient with a guided surgery, uh, there was one set of provisionals, but she did wear an Essex appliance throughout that. And then her first provisional was the one with the small little stubby teeth. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a great question. Provisionalization is the key to, um, to the buildup of the final. Yeah, I rarely go straight to a final of the anterior. It's really, it's really tough to control the soft tissues. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.